Part 1. The Beginning. Chapter 5. Rise of the Hyptians. Humans are a precious species, from peaceful opportunists to troubled predators. Tig is a stranger to the, their world, unknowingly being called God before their thirst for truth. Is she forced to live up to their expectations? No, but they in fact need her. Humans yearn a simple life where most of their problems are hidden away. But yet, as it would soon to show, humans are notorious for their battles towards authority. Already, Tig has created a human-like species called Cilians, who are perfected to handle disease and negative biological effects such as cancer and autoimmune disorders. Theolin, who was one of the first Thilians to meet the humans that Tig discovered, she introduced them to the wonders of medicine and the knowledge of pathology. The once forest-bound humans that Tig encountered who knew very little about the world, turned into an enlightened new race of human that could reach for the stars many thousands of years before everyone else. The tribe that was the first to meet Tig was her first focus. They now live far out over the sea, on platforms constructed out of hardened rock and the new mysterious Cytonian force that kept them afloat. Tatra was still as close as she ever was towards Tig. With all of these new things and the Thilians, Tatra was still curious what Tig's main goal is. With the help of Tig's introduction of science and medical education, Tatra is now 132 years old. But with the death of her father, which took place before the Thilians discovered proper human medicine, she was left with an empty hole inside that she could not fill. The platform that were suspended above the sea had proper houses, walkways, and dedicated lands to grow food on. Life was more comfortable than ever. Even those who committed crimes are put into rehabilitation instead of being punished. But Tatra could not shake the feeling that this was just a blissful dream that distracted her people away from the bigger picture. She went to Tig's main quarters and asked her for her presence. She was met with a Thilian who asked her business. Welcome, Hiptian. Is there anything you want? Tatra looked a bit confused and said, Hyptian? Yes, you are Hyptian, Tig's bettered human, the Thilian stated. Tatra did not care of this title. She wanted to meet Tig and ask her what the point of her life is. The Thilian who stood before her have seen this look in a human before. They responded, I understand that this new world is difficult for you. Tatra immediately interjected, I am one, I am over 100 years old. 
hipped in or not, I want to speak to Tig. Dithilian got slightly surprised over her assertiveness. It's as if she knew Tig on a personal level. And before the Thillion could even think of a solution, Tig appeared. Ah, Tatra. I see you're doing well. Tatra, despite being met with the only one who raised her people to greatness, she did not change character. What is the point of all this? Tatra asked Tig. Tig paused for a bit with a slight surprised expression. The point of what? Tig asked. You said you came from the stars. But what is it you learned from those stars? But you still needed our help to know more about us. I thought you knew how to already help my father to cure him from the tiny creatures, Tatra said. Tig's expression now became more, more stoic in nature. She turned her head in disapproval and closed her eyes. Tatra continued, you are a god, right? Why did you let my father die? Tig suddenly opened her eyes wide and looked straight at Tatra. An eerie atmosphere filled the building that made all of the Thillians present silently walk away. Tatra has never seen this expression expression before. Tig just stared at her with viciously open eyes, mouth loosely open with sharp teeth showing. Confusion, disbelief, and a slight sense of fear consumed Tig. All that Tig could say was, I did not kill him. Something about Tig's expression gave Tatra a sense of total defeat. It was primal, as if Tig does not even know the concept of feeling guilt from causing the death of another being is. Tatra turned around and walked away. She was scared and started to question Tig, and starting to question if Tig is actually the holy god that she always believed her to be. Tig stared into the distance. Does the fact of not knowing something mean that she should feel guilt? Of course not. She's a Cytonian, not a human who has yet to understand the importance of growth. This is what Scythus taught her, and this is what pressed Tig to sift out the detrimental feelings humans develop due to their evolutionary history. Something has to be done in order to promote growth. Instead of breeding humans, she needs to breed an evolved species who are strong enough to survive in the unforgiving void of the universe. At a complete loss for the future, Tatra had to accept the unjustifiable death of her father in order to carry on with her life. A hundred years ago, her kind could only live to forty years old at most. She's now all alone. Everyone she knew 
either died from disease or got completely absorbed by Tig's new world. Her now immortal life felt more like a curse than a blessing. She could not even work for her dreams. When all of the hardships of staying alive was simply solved by Thillians with no work needed. It was a perfect paradise. But then she saw a group of people in white robes and tall hats walking by her house. They looked very excited over something. They were headed towards a section of the Sky Village that had several platforms going even higher. Some of them even drifted off into the horizon. Something was going on, and she needed to find out. I'm going to keep continue. Chapter 6. The Sertsek The Sky Village which was named Hyria, after the word for life and wishes, was expanding into something akin to a modern city. The humans, who are now called Hyptians, were gathering around in an exhibition on the most southern outskirts of the city. Tatra, who saw the commotion, were curious to see what garnered such wide attention. Tig was also there, sitting on the edge of a raised platform, looking at a large floating entity which had the appearance of a house. The underside was smooth and tapered to a point towards the front and on each side of the large entity were, symmet were a symmetrical set of protrusions that could move, and out of each one came a pure cascade of flames that seemed to propel it around. It's a Sertzek, said a familiar voice next to Tatra. It was Daleb, still alive and now working as a carpenter for the manufacturer who is presenting this new mode of transport. Daleb explains further to Tatra that this will open up the world for Hyptians who are mostly stationed with no way out due to the awkward placement of Tig's little playground. He looked up at Tig with his hands on his hips. Tig looked back, just smiling. Daleb looked back at Tatra. See? She's just a childish bystander. I don't know what you even saw in her. If you had any common sense in your this, can you shut up? Tatra interrupted. I don't want to get into trouble by further questioning Tig's actions. Dalib sighed and walked towards the Sertzek. Well, I will be boarding it and later tur return with some wood. You, you can follow with us for a bit if you want. Tatra still stood around, watching these new Sertzex flying about, all in different shapes and sizes. There were also a few perched on the beach where she met, where she first met Tig. People were having fun having parties on them, and some even raced each other to see which Sertzek were the most nimble around the corners of Hyria. Do you like them? Tig said meanwhile. Tatra got startled. My lord, 
please make a sound when you move. Why do you always have to do everything very silently? And then Tig said with an affectionate smile, I like it when you're scared. Tatra scrunched her eyebrows. Why? Tatra asked. And then again, a long pause from Tig. Seeing that you still have not lost your instinct to keep on living pleases me. I will not be around forever. There are others like me out there. Tig looked up into the sky and then tilted her head in an odd way, looking back at Tatra. But they sadly do not think like me. Something about the way Tig said it made Tatra feel an ominous presence. And soon Tig's expression took a sharp turn to shock and anger, just like before. But now the spike protrusions on the sides of her head jutted out in a straightened into a fierce angle. She was not looking at Tatra anymore. Tig's eyes were frozen in place. And very slowly, Tig turned her head towards the south. Something was clearly wrong, and before Tatra could ask, there was a loud thunderous clap that echoed all over the landscape. There was not a single storm cloud in the skies. Tatra had heard lightning before, but this one was louder and had a sharper snap to it. In the direction where the boom came from, she could see a large Sertzik which was on fire, and it was heading at full speed towards the city. It was out of control and was about to plow through the inhabited outskirts. Tig was awfully not keen on saving the buildings on the cusp of the crash, crash. Everyone at the exhibition luckily had a head start to off running away, but the giant Sertzik could not be stopped. Tatra yelled, Stop it! Tig snapped back and boomed to the front of the uncontrollable Sertzik. With debris flying, she gently slowed it down with her entire body. Its engines, its engines was still on fire, and there were still people on it who desperately wanted to get down. Tig smothered the flames and settled the third sec down. A stairway was created to let the people on it to escape to safety. Tig went towards the entrance into the Sertzek, still in complete alert. Tatra walked up the stairs, feeling as if she could help with the whole situation. Return to the others! Tig said with a monotone growl. Tatra still remained. But I wanted to help. Tig flicked Tatra's nose and entered the Sertzek. This whole situation was new to her. She knew it would be more safe to return back, but her stubbornness would turn out to be yet another thorn in her side. A swift movement could be heard from the side. Tatra stepped sideways to get f a far view down the dark entrance. She could see Tig moving backwards out from the, dis from the entrance, staring forwards at a dark shadow. She could not make it out because Tig was moving slowly in a supernatural pulse in supernatural pulsating steps. 
The dark figure was prowling at the same pulsating manner. Then Tatra could see, with shivers running down her back. She saw what she has not seen in one hundred years. Another Cytonian in their original form. This one was black like obsidian, sharper and more menacing than Tig. Both of them performed a very intense stare-down. Tatra did not want to move, but as slowly as she could, she walked towards the stairs. But even moving this slowly caught the other Cytonian's attention. Almost instantly, Tatra saw its mouth open with its eyes still staring. A blinding point of light appeared in its eye. Tig let out a sizzling whistle, and with lightning speed, she tackled their head shut, and a flash that enveloped the whole street turned into white streaks of light that emanated from their head. The streaks cut right through the roads, splitting the air itself apart into a shockwave that shattered Tatra's ears and pushed her back. She fell down from the edge of the Sertzig and landed hard on the ground below. With a broken wrist from the fall, she ran away as fast as she could. With ears still ringing, she could still feel the shocks in their chest from the fight she could not see. Tatra ran towards a group of medics who beckoned her. There was a, there were a lot of confused people who covered her ears and took cover under the roofs of, and benches. Those who were still out there on the streets looked in fright up at the sky. Tatra turned her head up, and she could see two streaks of light swiftly changing direction and spiraling towards each other. Whatever they were, they traveled with such speed it set fire to the air around them. The shock waves never stopped. The leaves, the leaves were slapped off their branches and windows were shattered. Tatra screamed in fear. The world was literally ending. Her head felt dizzy from the forces. She could not even see straight anymore. And not before long, she passed out. I'm going to continue in chapter 7. Life could just be a dream, having everything you always wanted, skipping across the mountain tops and walking on air. Tatra has been out for several hours. She woke up in a hospital that was partially falling apart. The booms from the skies appeared to have stopped. She was kept in a bed with bandages around her head to stop the bleeding from her ruptured ears. <clears throat> she asked the doctor next to her, What happened? Where's Tig? The doctor did not respond. He was too busy attending the patients next to her. She yelled, Doctor! What is it? He responded stressfully. Tatra sat up and coughed. Where is Tig? The doctor could not give a straight answer. He was just as confused as her. The hospital was partially open. And outside, she could see the city in complete ruin. She exited her bed and walked out of the hospital. Where are you going? 
It's not safe out there, the doctor said. Tatra ignored him and headed out on the streets. She could see entire buildings tilted and some of them sank into the sea. With no hearing, she could still tell it was totally silent. A ghost town. Towards the area, Tig first met a that Saitonian. She could see a platform with two figures walking around on top of it. She walked towards it, still nauseous, and tripped over sev several times. On closer inspection, she could see Tig and the other Saitonian, who has now transformed into a body similar to Tig's. Slowly approaching the platform, Tig spotted Tatra, and she immediately flew down to her. What is wrong with you? Tig asked in a stern tone. The other Cytonian followed after and raised her open palm against Tig's chest. The dark Cytonian spoke. Yes. Tig responded irritatingly, They deserve peace, not wars and death. Tatra still confused and scared, she yelled, Who is this person? And before Tig could respond, the dark Saitonian introduced herself. Tig was still looking at Targnil with suspicious eyes. She didn't even seem to care for Tatra's welfare around this new ominous Cytonian. Targnil asked Tatra, I assume that I should feel sorry for attempting to blow. Tatra did not know what to say. Tig slapped Targnil's face. They do not need to feel fear. Targnil bluntly responded. So, you are brooding a species full of ignorance and weaknesses. I bet they could not even last seven days outside the stagnant area. Tatra could not believe that Targnil, a Cytonian who didn't think twice of, s of ending her life, spoke such poignant words, which never even faced Tig. Maybe Dalib was right. 
Tuck didn't really teach humans anything about the outside world. Tatra was living her entire life within Tig's isolated playground, just mentally rotting away. Tatra felt a rising, boiling anger within. Not from disappointment, just frustration. And then she laid it on Tig. Tig, if you love us, why have you always been sitting there just looking at us, only smiling? You clearly have a goal. I don't know what it is. You gave us everything we wanted, but nothing that we really need to grow. You never told us about the Tarknil for a hundred goddamn years. We are not your ignorant pets. We're stupid, yes, but tell me. Were you even responsible for the invention that is the Sertsek? Tatra was furious. Targnil was duly impressed. Tig, however, looked at Tatra with an unfazed stoic expression. Tig responded, No, I was not involved with the creation of the Sertsek. I smiled because I felt a blissful relief that you were not the ignorant species I thought you were. I just want to keep you alive and healthy, away from the unknowns that hopefully you would find out unaided by my presence. Tatra was yet again met with Tig's inability to explain properly. I can't hear anymore. Your fights with Targnil made my ears bleed. And suddenly, Tatra... Uh, wait. And suddenly, Tatra paused with surprise. She could not hear anymore. But she could hear Tig and Targnil speaking to her. Completely stumped, she looked at Tig and Targnil. Targnil glanced at Tig with a smug grin and then looked back at Tatra. You see, we Cytonians are capable of doing anything that you couldn't even imagine. Your ears might be broken, but I can still stimulate the parts responsible for hearing inside your brain, Targnil explained. Tatra did not understand anything, but Tig came to her and took off the band-aids. She placed her hands over her ears, and within seconds, Tatra could hear again. Tig then beckoned Athelion to come and escort her away. Shocked by her actions, Tatra accept, accepted her escort away. Turning her head back, she could still see the two Cytonians discussing. Athelion next to her tapped on her back. It is Going to be fine. Now, where is your house? Tatra walked together with Athelion to the street that was supposed to be there, but it was not. Staring in complete disbelief at the lack of her precious home, which was now gone, Tatra just stood there, sighing. Vasilian, who was with her, now, now knew about her hardships, but still said with an optimistic tone, Do not fret over what is lost. 
I can invite you to my home. Tatra, completely apathetic at this point, followed the Cillian. Let's continue on Chapter 8, The Two Worlds. Cillians and Hyptians, both birthed from Tig's influence, had yet to understand each other. One is natural and one is artificial. After a large loss, they both want to assist each other to find their place in this new but perilous world. The Cillian invited Tatra into her house, which was also a Sertzik. Tatra was very tired, and she went to the nearest couch to relax. She went through both heaven and hell. The Cillian understood this and let her rest. The abode she was in was much more well kept than the hospital. Nothing was broken, and she could see a small as she she could see small children run around. One of them approached her. They looked at her with curious eyes. The Thelian who invited Tatra approached her and introduced myself. My name is Sirathelia, and these are my precious sniffs. She picked up one of her children and hugged them close with nuzzles and cuddles. Tatra, still tired, was elated seeing such love. But she still had a burning question. You are a Thillian, right? Do you have a dream that you want to strive forwards? Surathili responded, Yes, I love my children, but I also love you. It must be hard to see your world shattered before your eyes. I still carry on, and I want to make a safe place for my kids, even if it takes my last breath. Tatra looked around. Strange mechanisms she has not seen before. Some were placed neatly on tables, but some even floated in mid-air. They were responding to the kids. She had to ask, How did you find these things? What did they do? A small child excitedly ran to Tatra and showed her a long object that looked like an oversized nail. This is Speedy. We have fun together. My mom did not tell me what a coconut was. He drew me one. The kid then went to a drawer and brought a piece of paper with a coconut drawing on it to Tatra. Oh, that is nice. But what is a coconut? Tatra said, all confused. Sir Athelia explained, Speedy is Mises. Assistant. Whenever she flies out on her little trips around the local wildlife, Tig created tools for us to better understand the outside world and also protect us. Protect you from what? Tatra asked. Sirathelia chuckled. <laughs> protect us from ignorance. Tatra, you are the first person to meet Tig. You are older than me, and yet you are this lost soul who does not seem to do anything with your life. Tatra looked at Surathilia with a blank stare. No emotion. She was tired of being bossed around by Tig's creations. Sirathelia, who was working in the kitchen, slammed down a bowl in disapproval at Tatra's pathetic mood. At 
please come here and help me with the food. Tatra stood up from the couch and entered the kitchen. Sir Thelia was preparing some kind of paste in a bowl. She handed Tatra it. Can you knead it until it solidifies? Tatra agreed, and before sticking her hand into it, she told Sir Thelia, Where can I wash my hands? You do not need to worry about that. The paste eliminates any dirt that comes in contact with it. Tatra got a bit worried. Will it hurt my hands? Serathelia shaked her head. No, it knows the difference between filth and innocent beings. Tatra p- pretended to know what she was talking about and started to knead it. It was sweat, but when she pressed it together with her fingers, it formed into harder globules. She continued, and eventually all of the wet liquid turned into a squishy ball. When it was done, Seracilia took the ball and fried it into a pan. She chopped up plants and glazed them in oil. Tatra stood by while Seracilia then finished it all up in a single pan. She then spun it and distributed the food elegantly to the plate, onto the plates. The kids then rushed to Seracilia. She placed out the plates on the living room table, but they were not cutlery. They all ate with their fingers. Are you going to eat? Serathili asked. But I have no fork, said Tatra. Serathili responded sternly. Just grab the food and put it into your mouth. You can lick your fingers clean afterwards. Tatra ate the food. She picked up a crunchy piece and stuffed it into her mouth. It is really good, she said. Serathelia smiled and went back to the kitchen to clean the bowl and pan. But instead of using running water, she licked them clean. Tatra tried not to care. She finished her plate together with Serathelia's children, who were stuffing their faces with not a single care in the world. With the food done, Tatra set the plate aside and went back to bed in the couch. She fell asleep rather quickly. With Serathelia's food in her belly, She dreamed about a vast void with nothing inside it but a small, pale sphere. She heard a cry from it. It sounded like a song. It would be a bloody shame we died after a million of years of we tried from the greatest predators now we only cry looking up to the vasts of skies with our precious eyes a tool they fear yet there's no tear they only look back do you fear us or do you love us I'm not going to dance for you anymore Touch me. Tatra woke up. She was feeling a cold with a drop of sweat running down her brow. All of the children in Serathelia's home was nowhere to be seen. Even Serathelia herself was nowhere to be found. Tatra looked around in the search sack for anyone. She could not find any. She walked out and was met with only a blue ocean. Hyria was gone, her city, 
even the beach where Tatra once came from could not be seen. She was completely isolated.